shall we pray? Precious Holy Spirit, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word which comes in power. Thank you that your children are blessed because truth is unveiled unto your children. We give you glory and praise that the name of Jesus alone is exalted tonight. Thank you that the Father is honored in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to teach on the communion, um, hopefully for the next five meetings, and you're going to be mightily blessed. Tonight, um, starting with a general overview on the subject, much as I tried, I couldn't really enter into the message today when I was preparing, but you'll be very mightily blessed. I want to give you the context of the communion tonight, and I would hit on just one point, but as we continue with the other meetings, I'm going to expound on it, and you'll be very mightily blessed. So, I start off with this context that there are many celebrations in the church which are not scriptural, but they are fine because they focus on the Lord Jesus. They aid the world to focus for a time on the Lord Jesus. And it's up to us, the church, to take advantage of those days to advance the interests of God by way of preaching. An example is Christmas. So Christmas is not a scriptural institution in the New Testament, but it was taught needful by the early church fathers, particularly the Roman Catholic Church, the church in Italy, Rome. And when they realized that on the 25th of December every year, um, there was this paganistic, very popular Roman celebration which pervaded the Roman Empire. And it was so attractive that even Christians would, on those days, join in the fray. I mean, if you know of the Carnival of Rio, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, you can imagine as such. So that's, that was how 25th of December was in the Roman Empire. It was a very paganistic um, but attractive festival that everybody joined in. And some Christians were joining in during those times and doing all the things they were not supposed to do. So the church fathers thought that, no, why don't we set up a parallel celebration which focuses on Jesus on the 25th, so that on the 25th, Christians can, instead of joining the pagans or the unbelievers to do all those things, would focus on the Lord. And that bets um, Christmas. It's, it's similar to, again, um, Easter. So Easter, it's not a New Testament institution per se, but it was again taught needful by the early church fathers because Easter is Passover. When we say Easter, it essentially means Passover. And Passover is a, is a celebration of the Jews to um, commemorate their um, exit from, or their redemption from Egypt. The Lord told them to do it every year. So the Jews would hold the Passover. And because a lot of the Christians then were Jewish, they had Jewish roots, during the Passover, they would go back and join the Jews to celebrate Passover. And their theology was being conflicted. So what the church fathers did was to institute Easter, Christian Easter, as a parallel celebration around the same time, because the church fathers knew that Christ was the real Passover lamb. And so if we were to commemorate anything, it has to be Christ, because what God actually meant in Exodus was Christ. And so they instituted Easter in parallel to the Passover, so that during that time, um, the Christians would not join the Jews, but would um, focus on Christ, his death and resurrection during those times, and have their faith built up. So those are the intentions, but these celebrations are not scriptural. They are not New Testament. However, the Lord Jesus himself instituted two, two memorials or two, um, two practices. Those were what the Lord Jesus himself left the church. One is water baptism and the other one is a communion. And so the communion is one of the most important institutions of the New Testament, because those it's one of those two which were established by the Lord himself. Hallelujah. Let's kindly read Luke chapter 22 from verse 19 to 20. And our sister Gifty 
in Spain will be doing the reading tonight for us. Luke 22, 19 to 20, and also would we'll continue with 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23 to 25. I'm setting the context, so please follow me. Okay. Luke 22, 19 to 20. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. First Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, which when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as Oft as he drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. 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 So the Bible says that the night before Jesus was betrayed, he instituted the communion and he said they should take it in remembrance of him. We should not forget this. That is the purpose of the communion, to remember the deaths of the Lord Jesus. Now, about 25, 26, maybe 27 years after this incident, the Lord Jesus the Apostle Paul comes on the scene teaching the church in Corinth and he tells them that he was not at the upper room the day the Lord Jesus instituted the communion. However, in his personal revelation of the Lord, the Lord taught him personally the same thing, that they should take the communion in remembrance of him. And the Apostle Paul extended the remembrance to cover something very profound, which is actually the focus of our conversation for this month. And it's captured in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. The Apostle Paul extended the context a little bit. So give to kindly add the verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So the Bible says that as often, as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, in addition to remembering the Lord's death, we also proclaim it. We also speak it forth. We also testify it. We give facticity to the Lord's death until he comes. In other words, as often as we take the bread and we drink the cup, we proclaim the benefits of the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim the benefits of the Lord's death until he comes. I'm repeating, we proclaim the benefit of the death of the Lord until he comes. And today, I want to open up just one of the benefits into us, and then subsequently, we would follow. But you see, I need to ensure you, I need to vaccinate you against extremities in doctrine on the communion. There are some ministers in Africa, in Nigeria specifically, or one or two ministers who are teaching that the communion is not a New Testament institution. The claim is that the communion is a shadow and that it was practiced in the early church because the early church was still under Judaic influence. It was still, you know, the church was born out of Judaism. And so, and in, in, in Judaism, they were taking the communion anyway. And so it's, it's, it's something which came with the church, but it was never intended. And so if we take the communion in the New Testament, along with water baptism, we are living an Old Testament life in the New Testament. And so because of that, there are many across Nigeria now who follow such ministers and probably across the world who are not taking the communion because they have been taught that it is an Old Testament practice. So I really want to um, ensure the house against that because some of us may have come across um, such arguments. I will not mention any name, but if, if, if you are somebody who listens a lot to some of these conversations, you would know who and what I'm talking about. The challenge is that when such teachings come from renowned ministers, you would find many Christians who would not take their time to delve into the word themselves to 
like the Berean church, read for themselves and find out what is said. Once it has come from their spiritual father, or once it has come from their bishop, they accept it as it is. And that's the laziness of the contemporary church <clears throat> and we need to address. And it's tough because um, in African culture, you can't, you can't um, offer an alternative to <clears throat> what your bishop has said. I mean, if your bishop has preached something, or if pastor has preached something, who are you to go and question the pastor and say, pastor, I think what you preach is not in sync with the scriptures. You don't have that. I mean, you'll be treated as somebody who is, a, who is, who is this lawyer, you are disrespectful and all that. And so sometimes as pastors, we say more of these things and we get away, but we end up injuring the flock of God. So I want to seriously ensure you against these thoughts. Now, the apostle Paul, in the New Testament discourse on the communion gives a context. And I want us to pay attention to that context. The Apostle Paul starts speaking on the communion. He actually started in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and he continues chapter 11. It was human beings who divided, but the whole, the context of the communion, he started from 1 Corinthians 10, 1, and it continues through to the end of 1 Corinthians 11. But because of time, I will just shorten it and go straight to um, what I want to pick out to draw attention to, to establish the New Testament authority of the communion so that when you are taking it, you will take it with confidence. First Corinthians 11, 23 again, let's go there. And let's listen to what the Apostle Paul said. First Corinthians yes. 11, 23. First Corinthians 11, 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul says that he received of the Lord that which he delivered unto the church in Corinth, the communion, the teaching of the communion. He said he received it of the Lord. So it was not something the Apostle Paul himself put together. He received it of the Lord. But there is an interesting thing about Apostle Paul. You know that Apostle Paul got saved between seven to eight years after the church had been established. And between when he got saved and when he became an apostle was 18 years. So this conversation with the Lord should have taken place anywhere between 18 to 25 years after the ascension of the Lord Jesus. Now imagine if it were truly an Old Testament practice. Why would the Lord Jesus teach somebody 25 years after his ascension this to be taught to the church in Corinth? The authority of the letters of Paul are very profound. Look at what Apostle Paul said of the revelation he delivered to the church. Galatians chapter 1 from verse 11 to 12. Paul is speaking here and we have to pay attention to the words of Paul. Galatians 1, 11 to 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I thought it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So Paul says his gospel, the letters of Paul, we read, no man taught him. He didn't learn them from any book. He received them by direct revelation from the Lord Jesus. It means that anytime you are reading the letters of Paul, it's actually Jesus speaking through Paul, verbatim, verbatim. And so a man of such authority delivers this doctrine to the church in Corinth and says, I received it of the Lord and I gave it to you. I am persuaded on this accord that Jesus meant what he taught Paul years after his ascension because he instituted that as a New Testament practice. Hallelujah. So it becomes quite of a challenge when as ministers, we receive the revelations of Paul, but we pick and choose some and say that, oh, water baptism, that one is Old Testament. And the communion is also Old Testament. But all the other letters of Paul or all the other readings of Paul Yes, they are New Testament revelation. That's a pick and choose attitude, which does not help the teaching of the word or which does not help the right division of the word. So I'm saying this to um, ground us in the fact that the apostle Paul said, this thing he taught the church in Corinth several years after the ascension of the Lord, the Lord taught him directly. 
and he delivered it unto them. So it is a New Testament practice and we have to pay heed to what the Apostle Paul says on the communion, hallelujah. We have to pay heed unto it. And so tonight, I want to introduce to one, just one benefit of the communion and then we'll continue later. But let me help you with this framework in interpreting the Bible and appreciating what the Bible says on every matter. Truths is, is parallel. All truths are parallel. When I say all truths are parallel, that's what I mean. Everything you see in the natural, it has its original copy in the spiritual. For instance, you see roads in the natural. In the spiritual, there are roads. Heaven has roads. Heaven is a country. In Hebrews 11, the Bible says Abraham looks to a country whose maker and builder. Uh, Abraham was looking to the heavenly country. So heaven is a country, but within heaven, there is a city. Just like we have fiscal cities. Everything we see in the natural has it parallel in the spiritual. For instance, the tabernacle Moses built in the wilderness. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, that God told Moses to see that he does, did all things according to the pattern he was shown on the mount. It meant that the tabernacle had its original copy in heaven, and God showed the original copy to Moses, and Moses had to reproduce that copy on earth as a natural tabernacle. The temple Solomon built, the Bible says in um, the book of First Chronicles that David received it. He received the patterns. He received the design, the architectural design of the temple by the spirit. So what Solomon built has its original copy in heaven. So there's a temple in heaven which looked just like what Solomon built. Adam, we understand from the scriptures, was a copy of the true. The Bible says he was made in the image and likeness of God. So everything we see in the natural has a photocopy or has, has the original copy in the spiritual. Therefore, it helps when in teaching on the communion, you compare it to natural food. What natural food does to the physical body? It helps you to appreciate what the communion produces in the spirit and in the body of man. Example, in the physical, our life, the physical life, the human life, interestingly, is sustained by food. It's a very interesting concept. So when a man is hungry or when a man is starving, you will see this life ebbing out of the man or this life evaporating from the man when you are hungry, you become weak. You become susceptible to sickness and disease. Suddenly you begin to struggle to breathe. And this life which sustains us begins to live all because food has not entered into your system. Yet immediately the man who is hungry and dying begins to eat. Energy begins to enter into him again. Life begins to be revived um, into him again. And so, I mean, in medical practice, one of the first things they always want to do when a man is frail and is dying is to try as much as possible to get food into the system. Even though this human life is spiritual and you can't really see it, it is sustained by a physical element called food. And so physical food is a necessity for survival. Unless you are fasting, you are never advised to stop eating. Because if you stop eating, your natural life will begin to seed. It will begin to ebb from you. That's the power of physical food. Now, if physical food can produce this efficacy in a man, then you can imagine what the communion can do. The communion plays a very similar function spiritually. You see, although we have eternal life in us, strangely, this eternal life, to some extent, can only fully express itself when we take the communion. I'm repeating myself. Although we have eternal life in us, according to the scriptures, as I will show, this eternal life is strangely expressed in fuller proportions or fuller measures when we take the communion. And so if you're a child of God and you are not given to taking the communion regularly, 
what you are doing to yourself is that you are blocking the full expression of the life of God inside of you. In John chapter 6, from verse 51 to 57, Jesus was discussing with the Jews on the matter of his body and his blood. So the conversation was around the Jews eating manna on the deserts. And Jesus came to tell them that he was actually the true bread. What they ate there was a copy of the original. And he continued with some hard teachings of the communion. So let's kindly go to John chapter 6 from verse 51 to 57. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. And as the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Amen. Amen. So Jesus told them that unless you eat of my flesh and you drink of my blood, you have no life in you. He who eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood has eternal life at work in him. So in our case, we already have eternal life because we are born again. We've confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. We, we possess the nature of God. But this is the secret. This eternal life in us can be provoked into fuller expression. This eternal life in us operates on a renewal policy. This eternal life in us is provoked, is stirred up, is changed, is triggered, is activated by the communion. The more you take the communion, the fuller the expression of the eternal life of God in you. When we eat the communion, it provokes the life of God in us into action. It stirs up the fuller operation of the life of God in us. It provokes the movement of the Holy Ghost in us. The, the word I want to use is the word perambulation. I hope you've heard it before. It provokes the perambulation of the life of God into us, into us. It causes the life of God to permeate every part of us. It's like the communion is the thing which stirs up the life of God. It's, it's for us Christians. Immediately you start taking the communion with understanding. Anytime the communion hits your system, the life of God is stirred up. The life of God is provoked. The anointing begins to increase on you. Your body begins to operate on a whole new level of divine energy. Then you know what begins to happen? It begins to fight against aging and wrinkling of the body. It begins to fight against mortality. It is true. It begins to fight against mortality. And so you would find that any child of God who has this understanding works with a certain level of energy. They, they are strong. They are agile. They, they don't become weak because the life of God in the bread and in the blood augment the workings of the life of God inside of you. Hallelujah. It, 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 it fights against weakness and infirmity in the body. And so you would find that even though you are growing, because you are on the communion on a regular basis, your body does not age like the body of an ordinary man. So you could all be 50 years, but you would find that the body of the child of God who has an understanding of the communion and is the communion on a daily, on a regular basis, is, is, is much younger. It's much younger. You will find that the body is younger biologically than the one who is not on the same element. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You see, in the New Testament, there are four ways. The Bible says uh, we are taught we can wait on the Lord. Four ways of waiting on the Lord. And that was exemplified by the early church. By the early church. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and then we'll read 46. Those are the four ways in the New Testament we wait on the Lord. 
and look at one of the elements in the the Bible prescribes as one of the ways of waiting on the Lord. Acts 2, 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine mm -hmm. and fellowship mm -hmm. and in breaking of bread mm -hmm. and in prayers. I continue from 46. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple mm -hmm. and breaking bread from house to house, mm -hmm. did eat their meat with gladness and mm -hmm. singleness of heart. Amen. Amen. The Bible says the early church had a culture for they would pray together, they would fellowship together, they would study the word, and they would break bread. They will break bread. That was the culture of the early church because it was instituted by the Lord. And we re realize that as the early church did this, not one of them fell ill. Not one of them died of natural deaths. The death of Stephen was martyrdom. God had a way of preserving them, keeping them, as they fulfilled these four expressions of waiting on the Lord. We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, that the expression breaking of bread means the communion. I know some people have confused Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where the Bible talks about the breaking of bread with love feast. It's not love feast. Those are two different things. The breaking of bread, that expression there, actually means the communion. So let's, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Uh, 1 Corinthians yes. 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the Lord, of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Hallelujah. So the bread which we break is the same expression. I checked the Greek, the same expression. The, the same words are used there. The bread which we break, it's the communion of the body of Jesus. It's the communion of the body of Jesus. So the early church had this culture of waiting on the Lord, doing these four things. And the church exploded in numbers. They exploded in health. They exploded in prosperity. Why? Because anytime we take the communion, we provoke a greater expression of the divine life in us. The anointing upon us begins to increase. This is something I have practiced. And one time I was having a discussion with Dr. Georgiasa on it. And Dr. George spoke the same thing. I, I told him, Dr. George, when I take the communion consistently, the anointing on me increases so much. I begin to operate in a realm of revelation. He said, oh, okay. The same thing happens to me. I said, ah. One of God, you mean that's what he said? Yes. So because of that, I take the communion every day. Hallelujah. When you begin to take the communion, eh, the, 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 the life of God becomes very activated. And so you begin to enter into a higher realm of revelation because the wisdom of God begins to operate at a very high level in you. You begin to enter into a higher realm of understanding. You begin to begin to experience the literal presence of God in very intensified proportions. Hallelujah. In intensified proportions. Because the communion stirs up the life of God in you. Hallelujah. It stirs up the life of God in you. And you see, it also reaffirms our organic union with the Lord. It reaffirms our oneness with our Lord. It reaffirms the fact that we possess the nature of God. We have the same nature and the same life which runs through God. Is what runs through us. Therefore, hey, 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 hey. It, it, it testifies to the fact that we have the immunity of heaven. You see, we have the immunity of heaven. It, 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 the thing is that we, we do not see it manifest, even though sometimes we take it. And the Lord has taught me why it is so. And I will explain next week. But when we possess this knowledge and begin to operate by this knowledge, what happens is that we live above sickness and disease. And if there is sickness in our bodies, by faith, by faith, as we take the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, by faith, we would recuperate. By faith, we would recover. We would recover. And now I understand why sometimes we take the communion, but we don't see results. It's because we do not take it the right way. But I am convinced, hallelujah, that by the time we are done going through these teachings, talu frato shalevranto dibidi When you take your bread and when you take your wine, lo sheko valu you will know exactly what you are doing. I want to end with this. The great apostle Smith Rigglesworth died at the age of 87. And the autopsy report on his body showed that 
his body was as healthy as the body of an infant. An 87-year-old man had a body which was as healthy as the body of an infant. So the pathologist who worked on symmetrical sweat was, was surprised and asked the doctor of symmetrical sweat that what food, what kind of food was your father eating? So that at 87, his body was as tender and as healthy as the body of um, an infant. And the daughter went like, oh, daddy, he would take the communion every day. He would take the communion every day. He would take the communion every day. Indeed, it is time for us to see the full effect of the communion in our lives. And that's what I will challenge you to do. Beginning from today, the last 10 minutes of your prayers, either as a family or individual, committed, take, your, take the bread and take the wine and pray over it. Declare the benefit. Declare that as you take the communion, divine life is stirred up in you. As you take the communion, the life of God is provoked in you. As you take the communion, grace is activated in you. As you take the communion, the mantle of the Holy Ghost operates in you in fuller dimensions. As you take the communion, the nature of God in you is fully expressed. You walk in greater manifestations of the power of God. Declare these words over the the communion, provoke the power of God in the communion to action, provoke it by your prayers, provoke it and take it. If you are able to do this for the next seven days, the next time we meet next week, I may open just five minutes for testimonies. And I know that the prevailing testimony of the house will be that these days, the anointing of God has become so strong in my room. The anointing has become so strong in me. There are ways we can enter into the inner sanctum of God. And one of the ways is eating on a daily basis with the Lord, taking the bread and taking the wine and activating the power of God in the bread and the wine and declaring these benefits the death of Jesus has brought us into. How that by his death, we now have the ability Ability through the communion to live without sickness and disease. How that by the communion we are above the susceptibilities and the vulnerabilities of the natural life. How that by the communion we can operate in higher dimensions of the power and the grace of God. Hallelujah.